Charleston, South Carolina. Now let's talk about what happened here in 1861. On December 20th, 1860, South Carolina delegates to a special convention voted unanimously to succeed from the Federal Union. In November, Abraham Lincoln had been elected President of the United States with no support from the Southern States. Within six weeks after South Carolina's secession, five other states, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana, followed its example. Early in February 1861, delegates met in Montgomery, Alabama, adopted a constitution, set up a provisional government, the Confederate States of America, and elected Jefferson Davis as their president. By March 2nd, Fort Sumter was one of the few forts that remained in federal hands. During this time, Fort Sumter was still unfinished when Major Robert Anderson moved his 85-man garrison into it the day after Christmas, 1860, setting in motion events that would tear this nation apart four months later. Brigadier General Pierre Beauregard, commander of Confederate forces at Charleston, South Carolina, had been one of Anderson's artillery students at West Point in 1837 and did not welcome the prospect of firing towards his old friend and former West Point instructor. Here today I'm standing in front of a lookout post looking out over the Atlantic Ocean. Notice how they could have sat here and looked out and watched for enemy ships coming towards them. On April 11th, Beauregard demanded that Anderson surrender Sumter. Anderson refused. At 3.20 a.m., April 12th, the Confederates informed Anderson that their batteries would open fire in one hour. At 10 minutes past the allotted hour, Captain George S. James ordered the firing of a signal shell. By daybreak, batteries from Forts Johnson and Moultrie, Cummings Point, and elsewhere were shelling Fort Sumter. You'll notice over my left shoulder is more Asylum, where the Confederate Army set up their positions to shell Fort Sumter. Inside the fort, Major Anderson withheld his fire until 7 o'clock. Though some 60 guns stood ready for action, most never got into the fight. Nine or ten case guns returned fire, but by noon, only six remained in action. At no time during the battle did the guns of Fort Sumter greatly damage Confederate positions. The shelling continued throughout the night. The next morning, a hot shot from Fort Moultrie set fire to the officers' quarters. In early afternoon, the flagstaff was shot away. About 2 p.m., Anderson agreed to a truce. That evening, he surrendered his garrison. Miraculously, no one on either side had been killed during the engagement. Only five federal soldiers suffered injuries. On Sunday, April 14th, Major Anderson and his garrison marched out of the fort and boarded ship for transport to New York. They had defended Sumter for 34 hours until the quarters were entirely burned the main gates destroyed by fire, the gorge walls seriously injured, the magazines surrounded by flames. Civil war, so long dreaded, had begun. The Confederate Army occupied Fort Sumter until August 1863, when the Federal troops fired a few experimental rounds at the fort in late July and early August. The bombardment began in earnest on August 17th with almost 1,000 shells fired the first day alone. Unless you're a marathon swimmer, getting to Fort Sumter isn't easy. Come on! Let's cheat and take a 20 minute ferry boat ride to get there. I can't wait to check out the cool features at Fort Sumter. You can see for yourself when you visit this site. During the second half of the battle, the Union troops fired upon Fort Sumter heavily. As you can see, here is a shell remaining in the wall. In this location, this is where a huge cannon was fired towards the Atlantic Ocean. The bolts still remain here today. This is Sandy Huffers reporting out for Lime Sun Society and CAR. I hope you've enjoyed this tour at Fort Sumter. Have a great day, everybody.